Hello. How are you, Lisa? I'm very well. Thank you, Matthew. How are you good. today? Really good. Are you suffering from a sugar hangover because of Halloween? <laughs> I just found a melted Twix bar in my pocket of my jeans. <laughs> hello, hello. Lisa Pierce is our guest today. What part of the world are you in? I'm in San Francisco. Ah, okay. Your uh, wonderful accent would betray San Francisco. So <laughs> tell everybody where you're from originally. I am from Australia, from Sydney. I actually lived in England as a small child, uh, but I've mostly lived in Australia most of my life. But I was married to an American. And so my kids have dual and I now have dual. I became an American citizen this year. Good for um, you. That's fantastic. You know way more about our country than I do. <laughs> Probably. But don't uh -huh. test me now. <laughs> not going um, to. So I've been here about 10 years. Got divorced, mm -hmm. needed a change. He stayed there. I came here. And what about the kids? One here, one there. So, oh. yeah, it's always missing somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've been in San Francisco for how long now? I've been in the city here. I'm in North Beach uh, for three years, but I was in Marin. I lived in some other places okay. before I before I settled on San Francisco. So you had a bird's eye view of what was happening to San Francisco over these last several years, including the COVID time. What the hell yep. is going on in San Francisco? Oh, God. Look, I'm looking out at a beautiful blue sky. I can see the yeah. very top of the crookedest street, you know, Lombard Street. I can see oh, sure, out of my window. Well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot about San Francisco that's wonderful. Um, there is. We don't see as much of the buses. You know, there used to be these huge, big buses ferrying people down to, to Silicon Valley. I think a lot more people are working from home and or have moved out of the city now. Obviously, the COVID, you know, had its pros and cons. And what people always ask me about is the homeless. And I'm, and it is terrible. You know, there's yeah. a really bad problem with homeless people, mentally ill people who, who aren't getting the right care. Uh, fentanyl, obviously, the whole drug. Wow. So, um, you know, most of the things probably that you and I are into, you know, all the things about food and spirituality and new yeah. age stuff and all of that sort of originated here and is still here to some degree. Right, right. So it's, uh, yeah, you can hear the woo-woo all over San Francisco and the uh, metropolitan area. <laughs> I'm full of woo. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. <laughs> you know, uh, I I really love what you do, the bringing in corporate actors to be able to help companies excel in their marketplace is a very interesting concept. So let's flesh that out a little bit. Tell okay. folks the name of your company, what you're doing, and then I'll have some questions I'd like to throw by you and see and see a little bit more about the uh, the far-reaching ways that you can help companies. Yeah, thanks. I love what we do as well. And it's surprising to me because I was an actress most of my life in Australia. I did a lot of film, television, uh, you know, everything, narration, voiceovers, commercials and things like that. And I sort of fell into this business doing role play uh, for training and development and ended up running a team. And 25 years later, <laughs> I have a global team of incredible people uh, so that I can match my clients in terms of, do you have people in India? Do you have people in Singapore? Do you have people around the States, Asia? And what we do is we help intrinsically people to be happier at work. And to be happier, you need to have the conversations that need to be had. You know, don't sit on them, wait for them, practice them. So our actors help people practice those challenging or difficult conversations. Um, and then we give them feedback and coaching on how that communication is affecting us. And that's our, you know, that we do other things, presentation skills, coaching and other things, but that's our become really our core offering. We have a couple of examples of what typical speed bump or friction point would be for a company and why they would reach out to you and say, hey, Lisa, we need some help. Well, for example, uh, our biggest client and one that's going through a lot of change right now is Cisco Systems. They're a huge, big international tech company. And this isn't just them, but people are finding that because they don't, well, the biggest reason people leave their job statistically is because they don't get on with their manager. They don't get on with their manager. They don't get on with their team. Um, and rather than confronting whatever the issues are, they leave. 
And, you know, that company has spent years training them, getting them up to speed, get their technical ability and all that, but hasn't spent the time on being a better human, being able to actually have a conversation without bias, without emotion, just to lay out the facts of what's happening, agreement and collaboration on doing better. Okay, so I understand. So that's really intrinsically what it is, like what is being happy? It's being right. able to relate and communicate with yourself and with others. Okay, I understand exactly what you're saying. I understand the friction point because I've seen that and I've also run play shops and organizational uh, retreats and stuff Have like you? that in the past. Oh. And I've been involved in ah. the whole Hollywood thing for a long time and communications, of course, is my biggie. But yeah, yeah. who calls you in? Let's say, is it HR? Is it management? Is it the C-suite people? Or is it employees? Who's calling you to say, we've got an issue we want to overcome. How can you help us? So who's the first reach out point? You're well, I mean, yeah. we do do private sessions with people. I've got a presentation to give. I've got a conversation I need to have. Can I work with you for an hour? More often than not, it's either the HR department or people who are giving trainings. So we might not develop the content. They might just say, okay, I've got this content. I've got these scenarios. Do you have the people to you know, enact and carry them out? So it really depends. It's like, it's very hard. We don't have... Um, you know, sort of standardized offerings. Although, of course, there are similarities in what we teach and what we give, but it's always bespoke. So it's always we work with the challenges that that particular company or that particular person is having. If a company A, let's say Cisco, because you brought them up and they're one of your yeah. clients, is feeling that they're not as productive as they'd like to be and they decide to call you in, what is the name of your yeah. business? Peers and players. So let's say they call peers and players and they, yeah. they want a little bit of attention and they cannot really identify anything more than the fact that they're not as productive as they'd, as they'd like to be or they're not as happy as they'd like to be. How do they state that? What, what's the first conversation they'll have with you? What is that like? <laughs> They come, they're crying. No. <laughs> you hand them a hanky, here's a tissue. <laughs> uh, again, it depends, but it's usually, you know, we want to have a program around critical conversations or uh, diversity and inclusion or uh, bias training. Uh, how can you help us to flesh that out and bring it off the page? Because more often than not, people know the theory. They often have the theory. They've given a ton of training on the theory, but it's one thing to read about it and watch a PowerPoint and watch some videos perhaps, and it's another thing to bring it off the page like we do and actually viscerally have you know that, that experience, that practice. If you are employing corporate actors to help companies, professional companies, overcome friction points, as I like to call them, how is it that corporate actors would know this and why would you hire someone like a corporate actor to help a big huge corporation overcome business situations instead of maybe like a business professional an entrepreneur who's actually suffered and created and discussed and overcome those things i i just yeah yeah that, i want to see question. how yeah and, and people hear about role play and people go you know, we prefer not to use that word we like right. to say skills practice because you can role play all you like with somebody who's not a professional at it and their own bias, their own experience and their understanding of the situation is going to color that conversation. So for us, and I want to say too that differentiating points of my business compared to others who provide corporate actors, one is our global reach, but the other is that most of our people do have, we, I don't hire star actors. I hire supporting actors who are there to support somebody else to perform well. And so most of us have experience in running a business or working in a bank or managing, you know, a restaurant or whatever it is, but most of us already have some experience of other facets of the business world. And so we bring that sort of understanding into it. That was the missing link in my mind because I was mm -hmm. wondering how would a quote unquote, corporate actor have the business acumen to be able to deal with educated yeah. professionals in any sort of field. Well, we also do a lot of training, you know, first of all, my selection pro process, 
for actors is very stringent, uh, but because I've been doing it 25 years, you know, I have a lot of people now on call in different places. And so I make sure that it's the kind of actor, not only somebody who can play a role and then sit back and, you know, exit stage left, <laughs> somebody who can, it's almost like we're portraying those roles and we might be a subordinate with a problem or a peer who's not collaborating or even a boss who's uh, not managing us the way we want to be managed. So we're acting that role, but often with 30 participants in a day right. you know, or 20. So we have the ability to uh, like recreate that character, start from scratch and give the prompts that are there to find, you know, to, to help the person to portray their skills. So if we know that we want people to show empathy, rapport, resilience, you know, they're often big ones in being a good human being. Oh, we, yeah. we have a very succinct way of prompting for that. So that, and then we're evaluating, well, what feedback and coaching am I going to give to that person when we're done with this scenario? And so we're almost like the actor, the director, the editor, and the coach and the trainer. Because once we're finished with the role, boom, here's our, you know, coaching hat. Sounds and like so, there's a lot of psychology that might be involved in this. Is this something yes, that is in your yes. background? And do you teach yes. your people NLP and psychological ways of being able to approach situations? <laughs> Glad you asked that. Um, I actually studied, well, firstly, I was married to a psychologist. And so I learned a lot about NLP, the Enneagram, different modalities and things. Um and I went to India and studied NLP for two weeks with an incredible teacher who had worked with the founders of NLP, uh, uh, Bandler and Grinder. And so I've studied NLP and I've also picked up a lot along the way from different clients who wanted us to use different models, pro model, disc, personality typing. So, I, you know, I have an interest anyway in people and I've tried to sort of disseminate that down into the way that I train my actors. Over the years, have you noticed that there are a lot of older corporate types who are used to the way that things have always been for so many years going back? Yes. And then you have more evolved types who understand that there are methodologies to be able to help heal and grow and learn. And Absolutely. how do you deal with that when, let's say you come across somebody who's still stuck in the 1960s? <laughs> I don't know about the 60s, but yes, no, that is a problem, particularly like we just did a big job in Australia for a government department, and we've done some government work here in the States as well. And particularly in a very traditional type of organization, there is that my way or the highway kind of um, attitude and modality. Right. And so we do try to work with that to give them feedback on that. Um, and, yeah. You know, our whole feedback method is. When you said or did X, Y, Z, whatever it was, I felt this. And so we give them irrefutable sort of evidence about something you did or said, I felt that. And they're like, wow, I didn't. And, and positive and negative. You know, it might be when you said, I understand you, you furrowed your brow, you leaned forward. I felt understood. I felt cared for. I felt safe. When you said, well, it's got to be in and you, you know, folded your arms and it's got to be in or you looked away. I felt dismissed. I felt accused. And so because we like uh, describe the exact, not just the words, but the behavior and how it affected us, that is irrefutable evidence. And so they can't say, no, I didn't say that. I didn't do that. You know, so it's very, very clear effect that, that, that that's having on the person in front of them. So do you see sometimes that people are resistant to <laughs> evolving, Absolutely. resistant to to being knelt, as I like to call it, and that they think, oh, there's this person now speaking to me, you know, giving me all the woo-woo stuff. And like, you know, I've been doing it this way for 30 years and I'm not going to change. I don't even know why this is happening. HR called you in. And do you deal with a scenario like that when you deal with people who are really maybe unwilling to move? Well, you know, if you know a little bit about NLP, it is a very guiding force in the way we work. And the big concept is meet someone where they are. So whether that's by the way that you interact or the way that you understand. So if you can understand where someone's coming from and reflect that back to them in a way that like you're doing now, nodding, yes, I felt seen, I felt heard. Then for me, that's the way 
to help somebody most effectively and help them to feel like, yeah, I get you. I know that's always worked that way. What What's worked about it for you? Ask them some questions, you know, and then find out what is their outcome. How would you like things to, or the obstacles, obviously, and the outcome. Most of our training isn't mandatory, but some is. And strangely, it's usually the higher level people who it is mandatory for. And uh, we do believe that the training should start at the top and trickle down. Because if you can have a boss or a manager or a CEO who's willing to be vulnerable, willing to learn, then that's a great example for the rest of the organization. Do you find that the leaders of many businesses understand the power of local empowerment and communication and how much really comes across with the words we say versus the way we say those words? I think a lot of our clients are tech people, engineers, business focused people. And so it does take a training like this to help people to understand that there's more to communication. Mm -hmm. And they always say, oh, well, what am I going to get out of this? Well, how long did you spend learning to be an engineer? How long did you spend learning to be a coder? Oh, five years, 10 years. I'm like, well, how long did you spend learning to communicate with your team, to communicate with your boss? Oh, nothing. <laughs> I'm like, well, right. <laughs> these are skills. These are also skills. You know, it's always come down to that. And I don't care what field of endeavor a company or a person is in. It always comes down to the training of the staffs. And just like exactly what you just said, yeah. it's not so much about your specialty. It's the way that you communicate to your vendors, to your employees, to everybody you are surrounded with in your universe. And it sounds like that's something that you focus on a lot. It's so important. People don't realize that if you, for example, if you're speaking to a slow speaking person, if you speak slowly to them, regardless of the words, they're going to feel understood. And that's going to help them feel people like people who are like them, you know? And so if you can match the person like we were talking about before, it can help them to be more open to collaborating, be more open to growing. It's fascinating. Obviously, <laughs> I yeah. love what we do. It just jazzes me every time. Every time we do a session and people are like, wow, that was so effective. You know, the feedback we get is so, so incredible. How do you, <laughs> how do you take a conversation from company A, B, or C and say, okay, I understand the issues, the challenges that you have. And then you think to yourself, who would be a good fit for this company? So how do you delegate that authority? How do you decide whether you're going to ask Matthew to communicate with that company or whether it's John or Sophie or, or yourself? How do you make that decision? Yeah. Usually based on the, well, firstly, the, the region and the demographic of the company. If it's a younger company, a younger organization, I tend to use my actors who are like in their 30s, 40s, you know, and if it's like you're talking about more of a senior cohort, then I'll, I'll employ the older or more senior. <laughs> I shouldn't use the word old. The more senior uh, people. And of course, you know, if it's if the branch or whatever is in India, then I'll use my Bangalore people. Right. If it's in Singapore, the Singapore people. If it's the States, because a lot of my competitors or other companies, they're based in the UK or they're based in New York. They bring those people over to another country. And so that is what really I found to be so useful is that although the sense of being a better human is the same and the scenarios we use are really just a frame for that humanity, cultural differences really, really make a difference. And so the fact oh, that yeah. say, we can be running the same training, but with the people in India for India, Asia for Asia, states for the states. Um, it makes it a lot more accessible. Earlier in the conversation, it sounded like most of your trainings, most of your times with the companies that you're working with are done electronically, sort of like what we're doing right now. <laughs> well, actually, it used to be a one and a half day training in person, in New York or Canberra or, you know, mm, different right. place, Singapore. And then, of course, when COVID hit, that all went away. And people started asking us to do virtual training. And I thought, no way, you know, <laughs> you can't get that visceral experience. But yeah, most of it now is WebEx or Zoom or one of those. Uh, and it is amazing because like this, you know, you have that 
intense experience with somebody, usually we're in a breakout group. So I would have, say, four participants. Sure. And each one in turn would go through a scenario. And so they're also observing each other and commenting on each other and supporting each other. The last three years or whatever, it has been largely virtual. But now all of a sudden, I mean, last week we had Boston, then we had Canberra and we're working on, and Amsterdam, and we're working on Singapore for an upcoming training. So in person's coming back. Oh, is that right? All those places yeah. you just mentioned are going to be in they person? They were all in person. Yeah. Oh, nice. In the last nice. like six weeks, we've had four in person. So. Oh, that's very, very yeah. cool. Which is How cool. for a few minutes ago, you said, if you have a company that's maybe a little bit younger than a certain person, you might have a younger employee of yours working with them. Do you find that younger people listen to younger people more so than looking to a, a person who's beyond their age, maybe who has a lot of experience? I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, I personally and other people in my team who are of my seniority, we play any role. So our sort of skill is being really, really, really focused. So I think that it's more being really focused Yeah, helps people to have to be focused in with you. And, you know, having more seniority does lend more credibility to you as, as the coach. It so when back. you take off the actor hat and put on the coach hat, yeah, and I think the fact that you've been doing it for 10, 20, 30 or whatever years. So it's, it's a trade-off. You know, it's always a trade-off. Do you spend a lot of time structuring the conversation ahead of time before your group goes in there, before you go in there? It's a way to kind of clearly define your key points or the company's key points and, and then how you're going mm -hmm. to then communicate that and establish that within your virtual meetings? Yeah, we always have a quite thorough understanding of the company. But again, we go in and say, look, we're actors. We're not, and we're not going to, and we don't want to go down any technical paths. We always prompt them for the human skills. And so right. it's almost to our advantage that we don't understand perhaps a lot of the, you know, we don't know how to be a coder. We have a, but we right. have a basic like outline of what that is. So yeah, we do, we do impart as much as we can of knowledge of the culture, the organizational you know, hierarchy and that kind of thing. But really... Essentially, we're always focused on the same thing, which is how do you help the person in front of you? Yeah. And it, it comes down to the human communication stuff. Yeah. And you talked skills. about woo. You know, I always yeah. tell the actors, like, have an open heart going into this conversation. Be there to support somebody else. But I don't right. necessarily use that language with the client, you know. Yeah. But from our perspective, we like to really be there consciously to help and to assist. And sometimes skills that actors know, like I was talking about, how to use your voice, how to pause, to stand, how to have, you know, body language, which is a whole other concept. But things that we learn for years in drama school are things that most people have never considered as part of human interaction. When you're dealing with companies that are from another land and they're not as comfortable <laughs> with direct eye contact like yeah. we are here in the yeah. United States or Australia yes. or whatever. Yes. How do you then and that in, incorporate that into getting them to become more human or getting them to understand a little bit more about communication, which sometimes involves that very close kind of communication skill? That's a really good question because it is a very big thing. And that is why we have people in Japan, Singapore, you know, China, places where perhaps our concept of eye contact isn't the same. So it is a balance between, okay, you're working for an international organization. There is an expectation that you meet somebody face to face. And we also understand that you have cultural mores. So it's very individual, but it is a very valid point that you're making that what is comfortable in one culture is not necessarily comfortable in another culture. That's why we have people in, in the places who understand. It totally makes sense. Because I can't say, I'll be talking to my people in Japan. I'm like, you know better than I do what the mores are in your, right. you know, what's, what's culturally appropriate. And when you speak to Europeans, they think of Americans, we <laughs> smile too much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and the smiles really get, it gets to them. Why are we smiling all the time? And why do we like to hug? What's with the physical closeness and all that? 
And mm. so those things are really interesting to me to see how we are perceived yeah. by others. Don't get me started. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm an immigrant. I'm from Australia, right. which is more of a British kind of culture. And so so a there little are a bit lot of things that I've had to get used to living in the States. Yeah. yeah. And is it some of the things that I just mentioned about the closeness, the intimacy, the, the smiles, the over-the-top aspect of our personalities? The volume. <laughs> the volume, right. The volume has a lot, you know, is a lot. Um, but your, your education and your culture teaches you to be more front forward with people. Right. And sometimes that does come across as disingenuous to somebody who's from a less front forward culture, mm -hmm. like Australia. Let's say I frowned when I said something <laughs> that, was, that was showing you something that was coming from within. So you're able to read it with your training, but how do you then teach me to maybe not frown in that situation? The first thing is to be aware. And so how often in life do you have someone in front of you saying, I noticed that you were frowning when you were saying that? So if the first thing is, was I? Oh, yeah, I was. So the first thing is self-awareness. And the first suggestion would usually be just be aware. Just learn to be aware. Just if you're at the bank or the store or with your family or whatever, start to be aware of that behavior. You know, because once you're aware of it, then you can change it. Right, right. Instead of you saying, Matthew, just be yourself. <laughs> Let's see, that's the problem. <laughs> is that something you're doing in your everyday world, not only in business? Is that you're trying to trying to figure someone out? You're trying I made so many mistakes in my own life with communication. I messed up so many opportunities when I was younger, when I was a sort of titled young star actress, right. communicated badly with so many directors, agents people i made so many mistakes i blew off so many opportunities that it's no wonder that i'm now you know trying to understand that better by yeah. teaching it yeah so i made a lot of mistakes <laughs> and i'm divorced <laughs> so go figure <laughs> if i was hiring someone i would want someone who had tried and failed many times and who kept yeah. trying and has had failures in their pocket because yes. if you don't have failures no one just rises to the top without making a lot of mistakes, right? And you can't really learn without having done that. So, yeah, totally agreed on that one. You mentioned something about happiness. And I know you're not teaching happiness, but <laughs> you're thinking about that. And how do you bring that to your client or to your life or to yourself? Is the way that you do that by actually increasing happiness or teaching people like, this is what I do. I try to offer up the suggestion that if they decrease unhappiness, mm. their happiness will increase. I like that. That's like the Leonard Cohen quote, right? The quote about the crack where the light comes in. Right. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, I thought we were going to talk about food. <laughs> well, thank you for that, because I was going to ask you, what have you eaten today? <laughs> I was hoping you would ask. For breakfast, I had um, New Zealand smoked salmon with goat cheese on sprouted wheat bread. And I'm having a cup of English breakfast tea. Well, New Zealand smoked salmon with goat cheese mm. on sprouted bread is very similar <laughs> to what I might have, lox and bagels. Yeah, right, right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Where are you from originally? Are you from New York? I was, I was born in New York. Right. My family moved to Los Angeles when I was 10. They didn't tell me at first, but I caught up with them and then um, moved to Hawaii in 93. <laughs> right, that's awesome. Yeah, you have an amazing too. background, and I feel like there are some similarities too, you know, because you, you spent so much time in the music industry, the food industry, and had your own business. You're also, I'd yeah. like to interview you when I start a podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm here for you. You know this. <laughs> so, okay, more with the food because you brought it up, and I'm just going to fly with that. Was that the gear you were going to switch to or was it something else? It was. It was e oh, okay, exactly great. the gear Perfect. because, you know, this show is famous for asking people what they've eaten and what they're about to eat and what they're going to eat later and, you know, all that. So you told us what you had for breakfast. What's on, <laughs> what's on for lunch? Well, it's Halloween, so, you know, <laughs> you got to have some candy. Okay, then um, give me a couple of candies that you like. 
I just brought back some Australian candies, Mars bars, and uh, I'm a little bit of a health nut, you know, and I've been through all different phases in my life. I was vegetarian, then I was a carnivore, then I was keto, then I was, you know, (laughs) I've tried candida diets, I've tried fasting, I've like, I, I do love food and the effect that it has on your body, food and or not food in the case of fasting. Sure, I get that. Where are you at this moment in time? At the moment, I'm pretty balanced. As uh-huh. you can tell by my breakfast, <laughs> carbs, right. protein. But yeah, I do. I do. And I used to drive me crazy. And I do find, as I get older, more and more, <laughs> more of my headspace is, is, you know, taken up with food. I've been yeah. obsessed, but, you know, I was a dancer when I was younger too. And so uh-huh. very obsessed about calories and all that, which I don't really think about that much anymore. But- and so what's some of your favorite cuisines? Well, I live in North Beach. And so I have Chinatown right over there. I have Little Italy right there. I have good coffee around here. Uh-huh. Australian coffee is very different, you know, and it took me a long time to get to figure out how to order a coffee here to have something oh, that yeah. I like because Australian coffee is a lot sweeter and smoother and, I don't know, more Italian maybe. Do you know what kind of beans they use in Australia for their coffee? Because it's not being grown there. No, I think it's largely Arabica, but I'm not really sure. But personally, I like to, at home, use organic as much as possible because, generally speaking, I'm not interested in putting too many poisons and pesticides into my body if I can avoid it. So when I I make it at home, I buy something organic. I tell people all the time, I say, you know, once you get an espresso maker and you start drinking it that way, you'll never go back to the crappy American drip style. Well, you're, that's your words, but I can't agree. <laughs> <laughs> my, well, my words. <laughs> oh, my words. Well, it's oh, very hard funny. sometimes to be a foreigner and come in and have preconceptions and judgments about the place that you're in. And after all, I'm here. I love it here. Yeah. And I do love as soon as I go back to Australia, my son usually picks me up from the airport and we'll go and have an Australian breakfast because there's nothing like Australian bacon and Australian coffee speak to me about australian bacon is that similar to the kind of bacon that they eat in the uk is it is it basically yeah. the loin more more so than it's the bacon more the that... meat and not as yeah. much of the fat right and we don't we don't cook it to a crisp it's more like you know chewy like meaty, ham meaty yeah yeah meaty so it's similar to what americans might call canadian bacon which is made from the loin instead similar, of bacon yeah. bacon which is made from the belly so what's your What's your favorite kitchen gadget these days? Oh, my favorite kitchen gadget is I just bought one of those rotating Parmesan cheese graters. Oh, yeah. Where you put it in and clamp it down and and it all comes out. (laughs) That's my most recent gadget rather than using a grater, you know. It is so funny that you talked about that particular thing because the other day I was having a conversation and there was a time in America, and I don't know if that is also in Australia, but when they used to at Italian restaurants, they'd have Parmesan cheese on the table and you could serve yourself and help yourself. Yes. And yes. then something happened. There was a glitch in the matrix and someone came out with one of those little twirly things to like shave a little bit of parm on you. Like it was like they, they divvied it out like it was Krugerrands or something because, you know, it's a pricey product, et cetera, et cetera. And they didn't want people just dusting their food with it. And so is that something that that you're aware of also, those kind of changes that happen in the culinary world? I do know I always have to ask for extra parmesan when I'm at an Italian restaurant. So, yes. Or they put them in the shaker and it has tiny little holes and you have to unscrew it to, like, really get some out. Hey, there you go. (laughs) Same here. Get that spoon in there. Yeah. Do you remember when the Chinese restaurants in the old days, they used to give you rice when you sat down, it was gratis and tea. And now a lot of places will charge you for tea. Absolutely. Uh, Yes. Last time I was in London, they put down tea and rice. And then at the end of the meal, when I was about to pay the the bill, they charged for the tea. And I said, well, wait a second. It's kind of crazy. Didn't ask for it. They put it down. It's like, you put it on my table, I'm going to eat it. But a lot of Americans talk about that also with the bread in Europe. They'll put down bread on your table. And if you eat it, you get charged for it. But they don't tell you this. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. What's your favorite kitchen gadget besides your espresso machine? Wow. Well, you know, I have have them all. So you tell. I have sous vide makers. I have uh, immersion blenders. I have um, digital probe thermometers. I have 
Right. You name it, I've got it. Right. I have those presses, like the sandwich presses, the panini mm -hmm. presses, you know, right, all that right. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've tried what it did all. You have for, what did you have for breakfast? Today, so far, just coffee, but typically eggs, cheese, mm -hmm. avocado, bacon, carb guy right now, have been for about five years, mm -hmm. uh, helping people with their metabolic health, helping people to lose weight, to get healthy, to reduce inflammation, to reverse type mm -hmm. two, all the things that, that I think are important. I didn't realize that was something that you do. It's a huge yeah. thing that I do oh, because yeah. after living such a, a life of excess for myself and my clients and the people that I've been with, yeah. you know, I finally got the, I got the memo late, but now I help people. So I've helped mm -hmm. a lot of people lose all mm -hmm. kinds of weight and reverse type mm -hmm. two diabetes. And that that's feels awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's such a problem here. Half of our audience right now, unfortunately, are suffering from type two or are obese or on their way to, you know, all different kinds of metabolic issues. And they just, yeah. It's no wonder because the information that we're given by our government, big food, big farm, and big medicine is all incorrect, or for the most part, quite incorrect. So I've been paying attention over the past 10 years and uh, absorbing as much good, real, new science about health, what to eat, and especially how to take care of yourself for the long term. So would you consider yourself a biohacker? Not really a biohacker, but I do mm -hmm. fermenting at home and do. I do intermittent fasting and understand the science. They just don't get it. They, they're used to falling asleep in the afternoon, like nodding out, you know, yeah. in the middle of the day. And they think that's normal. And it might be normal in the sense that it happens, but it's not normal as far as the human animal is concerned, because that should never happen. But what about countries that have a siesta? As I mean, Mediterranean diet is supposed to be great, right? And siesta, afternoon siesta is part of their sort of culture. So Mediterranean diet is a lot healthier than a lot of a lot of places diets. The siesta thing is becoming less and less so. And mm. that is because of the culture of the work world. And siestas were fine when people had 12 hours a day they could put into a work environment. But yeah. now business is different, commerce is different, and siestas are becoming less and less because I mean, who wants to work for four hours and then take a two-hour lunch and then go back to work? So, so because they're not having the big lunch, they're also not having the siesta, is what you're saying. Right. You're eating a lot of carbs, you're going to go to sleep. Yeah. People eat pancakes or lasagna, and those are delicious foods. I get it. But if you eat that in the middle of the day or at nighttime, you're going to fall asleep. People should take less Ambien and have a pancake maybe at night to get their sleep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a good way to kind of fight, um, fight the whole drug issue. But then, you know, food is a drug, also. A lot of people would argue. I like the concept of shopping on the outside of the supermarket. Yeah, definitely. You know, go around the outside where most of the food is whole, and avoid all the processed stuff that's all in the middle. What were you just thinking? Because I saw that you were something was spinning up there. I was thinking about what you were saying. You know, mm -hmm. about the analogy you were giving there. And also, of course, a few days till the election here in the States. And yeah, the polarity is intense right now. Do you think and most just, people are feeling scared right now? I think they have every right to be. Because I think whichever way the politics goes, there could be a, internally in the States a massive reaction, whatever that may be. And also just all the scary stuff that's happening in the world that could impact us. I think that there's a real cause for concern for humanity right now. Do you think that it's important to have friends with ideas, thoughts, and stances and beliefs that you don't believe in, that you can't stand? Is it good to embrace folks <laughs> like that instead of canceling them out, not being tight and close with them, but trying to understand their position? Or is that just too much to ask? I think that's very challenging for most of us. And depending on the topic. But yeah, I, I, I believe, and this goes back to what we teach, is we're looking for commonality. We're looking for the things that you know, unite us, the things that everybody wants. Everybody wants all of the basic human needs, of course, and we should want that for everybody. You know? And we all want to have people we love and people we love be safe and ourselves be safe and 
you know, our kids to get a good education and be happy and, you know, our parents to be taken care of or whatever it is. We have so much in common. And I think it's really sad that people focus so much on the differences. So, yeah, I think it is important to at least accept other people's views. I mean, there are some things that I'm never going to agree with, but it doesn't mean right. I can cut out half my family or my friends or whatever because of their concepts. This is interesting because it kind of dovetails into what your company does yeah. when we talk <laughs> about DEI, diversity, quality, yeah. right, inclusion. If you and I are to become friends, we're going to want to really enjoy each other and appreciate each other and respect each other. Mm. But if that doesn't automatically happen in a group environment, how do you help HR, how do you help the leaders, management, C-suite, and so on to be able to get along with this like literal smorgasbord of cultures, folks like that who have different beliefs and they're coming from different places? I think, like I said, it's embracing the commonality and really finding out from that person, well, what's important to you? What are your values? And I think if you're listening for someone's values in the conversation, it helps you to understand a lot more how to communicate with them because you know what's important to somebody. When you went to Australia last month, did you bring back Tim Tams? No, because you can get them here. Can you really? <laughs> yes, <laughs> at World Market. World Market has like half the things that I used to always bring back from Australia. Tim Tams, tea, Vegemite. Tell our audience what Tim Tams are because I'm sure most people don't know. <laughs> It's funny because there's now an American, uh, I think it's Trader Joe's or somebody's making a fake like Tim Tam. So I think they describe it as like a chocolate coated chocolate cookie with a cream filling. You can dip it in your tea and it all melts and becomes gooey and delicious. Okay. Totally addictive. <laughs> so don't eat it, Matthew. It's full of carbs. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not for me. Although I can totally appreciate that. I don't have any in my pantry. But next time you go back to Australia, before you go, let me know. <laughs> okay. Is there anything I haven't asked you, Lisa, that I should have or that you'd like to communicate? I don't think so. It's been quite comprehensive. I mean, I think you and I could talk for another two hours quite easily. Well, we will off the air. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much for spending a little while with me, Lisa Pierce. Yeah, it's been fun. Tell everybody where they can find you if they're interested in, like, you know, investigating what you're all about. Peersandplayers.com. Peers. My name, Lisa Piers, piersandplayers.com. And on there, we have some videos about what we do and some examples of our fabulous people all around the world and ways to get in touch. So, yeah. Do you have any chefs on your payroll? Chefs. Well, we've definitely had a lot of people who've worked in hospitality. I did just watch The Bear, but that's another conversation, but it's awesome. No, no. I want to know what you thought of The Bear. Tell me. I loved it. I thought the characters were complex and interesting and the relationships and the way that, and the way it was woven in with the food. Did you like it? Oh yeah. Yes. Season two was incredible, but you know what? Getting to that was an emotional roller coaster that at times prior to mm. season two brought back too many big time, harsh flourishes oh. and waves of emotion because I lived that oh. life. And so Getting started and sticking to it was very difficult for me. But yeah, one of the best series ever. So did you have the head chefs who was like really intensely putting you down and like perfectionistic and, you know, yeah, we had um, traumatizing? Yes. Yes to all those things. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, a guy who I often refer to as a person with a Napoleon complex who would yell and scream and throw knives at us. Oh, God. And wow. did that make us better? I don't know. That's why in one of my recent conversations, we talked about abuse in professional kitchens and why it's so prevalent. And does it help to abuse people, to scare them? You know, the whole fear factor thing. Does that work on people? And, you know, it would never work in one of my kitchens, but I've lived that life in other people's kitchens. Let's talk again. Yes. You're opening up a plethora of <laughs> interesting things. You bet. Lisa Pierce. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I want to say aloha yeah. to you. You've been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matthew. This has been awesome. Appreciate it. Aloha. Bye.